Welcome to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Much lies ahead here at St. Paul's. Next weekend is our youth bake sale, and the week after that, April 21st, starts our newcomer sessions. Also, a word of thanks. Emily Irwin has served as our youth ministry coordinator the last two and a half years. She'll be concluding her time in the role next month, uh, continuing as a dedicated member and volunteer, but want to express our gratitude to Emily for her great contribution and her time here. You can send your thanks to her at youth at doylestownlutheran.org. Thank you, Emily. Now, let us join in worship.
with you Let us pray Almighty and everlasting God who in the Paschal Mystery establish the new covenant of reconciliation. Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Gospel for this second Sunday of Easter and text for today's sermon according to John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. When I was in seminary, shortly after the invention of electricity and indoor plumbing, <laughs> I, uh, I preached my first sermon. I still remember the title, Thomas, the Dualistic Doubter. My text was from John 11, and Thomas said, let us go with him that we may die. I recall noting the positive, going, and the negative, dying. That's all I remember. I don't recall impressing anyone. And a few months later, I was elected heretic of the year. So be it. <laughs> but getting back to Thomas, he only appears three times in scripture. All three times are in the Gospel of John and all three have Thomas doubting. In John 14, text that we use at every funeral. You will recall Thomas says, how shall we know the way? And the best known of Thomas' appearances is today 
unless I see the print of the nail and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Dead people don't rise, not when the Romans kill them. Well, are we at fault if we don't believe? That's my question today. Are we at fault if we don't believe? I think the answer is yes. When, like Thomas, we don't go to where the light is shining. You heard the second lesson from the epistle of 1 John. God is light, and light is such a big word in the epistles of John and the gospel of John. God is light, and I think we are at fault if we don't believe, if we don't come to where the light is shining. Tom, John says that Thomas skipped church on that first Easter when Jesus appeared to his followers. John writes, the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And that was an understatement. If you want to believe, you have to come to where the light is shining. We hear a lot these days about conspiracy theories. A few years ago, I preached a sermon on vaccinations. I was talking about being vaccinated with big ideas and how it changes your life when you're vaccinated by big ideas that you hear every week in this place. I barely mentioned measles, polio, COVID, shingles, pneumonia, biological vaccines, and yet I got emails the following week from anti-vaxxers. The West Choir was singing that Sunday, and so we had a lot of visitors. Now, I'm no fan of Bill Maher. I think he swears way too much, and I love language, and I don't think that does anything to the presentation. I always tell our eighth graders, uh, words, it's, it's like a piece of Lennox, and you treat it with great respect. And so with language, you think about it, most swearing has to do with either religion or sex. Holy, great things, treat them with great respect. In any case, I, I kind of write him off sometimes because of his, his crudeness. And I also don't like the way he's always attacking religion. He doesn't seem to make any distinction between healthy religion and unhealthy religion. He seems to be hostile to all religion, which I think is painting with way too broad a brush. But in the last year or so, I've really come to agree with a lot of what he's saying because what he's been saying of late, even last Saturday, is that we need you and I to expose ourselves to different opinions. Last week he said, when reputable scientists from places like Stanford and Harvard Medical School say things that upset us, well, have an open mind. Invite them for a spirited debate. Let's see where the light is here. Mingle, as McConnell keeps saying, mix it up, change the channels, read different papers, invite people who are going to upset you. Doubt is not the opposite of faith, it's a part of faith. A dollop of doubt avoids the indigestion caused by tainted data. I don't know who said that, but I like it. We often quote Frederick Buechner up here, doubt is the ants in the pants of faith that keeps it alive and moving. Or the great poet Tennyson, there lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. Buechner had a student when he was teaching in prep school. The student's name was John Irving, who became one of our great novelists. And at the very beginning of Irving's novel, A Prayer for Owen Meany, he has a quote from Buechner. If there's no room for doubt, there's no room for me. Did you know in the 14th century, 20 million people died in the Black Death? Don Engels wrote a fine book about it a few years ago, which he titled The Rise and Fall of the Sacred Cat. And he said Christians back then disliked cats. And so they killed the cats. And this allowed the rats to run rampant, causing death and disease 
resulting in the Black Death of 1346 to 1351, when 20 million people perished in Europe alone. It so happens my Nordic ancestor developed a biological mutation that created more iron that kept them out of the Black Death and killed them later. And we only learned about 100 years ago that the cure for this mutation is simply giving blood. Science, but all the superstition that arose around it, you can just imagine. It's like the eclipse tomorrow. Wow, ancient people, how quick they were to take this, bio, this astronomical phenomenon and use it to control people. Engel says in his book that if the Pope wants to ask forgiveness for the sins of the church, he would do well to remember the persecution of clean cats by dirty Christians. Their anti-cat policy helped kill more people, he says, than the Crusades and the Inquisition ever did. This is why in this church, we say in our mission statement that we are guided by intellect. Bring your doubts to church. Join a small group, ask questions, change the channel, read different papers, mingle, pray often, knowing the opposite of faith is not doubt, but indifference. And let me make a case for regular church attendance. Thomas missed the first Easter when the community was there and Jesus showed up. He came back on low Sunday, that's today, and his life was transformed. The opposite of faith is not doubt, but indifference. And yes, we're at fault if we don't believe, if we don't come to the light and look for the light with an open mind. Second, I believe we are at fault in our unbelief when like Thomas, we choose a negative response to reality. So much in life is more emotional than it is intellectual, rooted deeper in the heart than in the head. People who believe and people who don't believe live in the same world and go through the same experiences. This is one of the best books ever written, I think, on the relationship between psychology and religion. It's called The Dynamic Psychology of Religion by Paul Prizer from the Men Menninger Institute a heavy book, but brilliantly exploring the relationship between, between psychology and, and, and religion. And here's a great quote in the middle of the book. The person of faith does not think about different things, but about the same things as any other person, but from a peculiar perspective in a different way and occasionally with a different outcome. We all live in the same world. We just look at things through a different lens. Remember the story of the two buckets in a well? One said, no matter how full I come up, I always go down empty. And the other said, no matter how empty I go down, I always come up full. Same facts. Or remember the little boy, he was eagerly shoveling through a pile of manure. And he said, ah, there must be a pony buried in here somewhere. Or the little boy in the backyard who was playing ball. Remember when you were a kid, you'd throw up the ball and you'd swing, you'd throw up the ball and you'd hit it. Well, he missed three times. And he said, wow, what a pitcher. <laughs> now, we can imagine Peter and Thomas getting on each other's nerves. Peter could agree quickly, believe easily. Peter saw the donut. Thomas was always looking at the hole. I hear Krispy Kreme is coming to McDonald's. I would talk to a nutritionist before you buy all those advertisements. Open mind, looking for the light. While it is true sometimes, that we get deceived because we believe too much. Far more often, we get deceived because we believe too little. And then we live in our cocoon, 
And we don't come to a fellowship where we can question with people who maybe think differently. Now, one final step. I also believe we are at fault in our unbelief if, like Thomas, we shut the door to all evidence of reality except what we can grasp with our senses. A woman asked me at church a few weeks ago, what have you been reading that's not theological? She caught me by surprise. I hope she comes back today because I just read this incredible book about Joshua Chamberlain uh, by Ronald C. White. He spoke nine languages. He was governor of Maine. He was president of Bowdoin College. He went in the Civil War at Gettysburg. Remember the biggest battle of Bighorn and he they ran with bayonets, and he was injured and came back to be governor and president. What a story. But what interests me is that Ronald White says none of the historians before him made any use of the three years that he spent at Bangor Theological Seminary, where he was a pastor. They don't want to touch that because it doesn't fit their, their situation of religious people not being very bright. I hear the same thing with Martin Luther King. Oh, he wasn't really a believer. It doesn't fit. And sometimes religious people do the same thing. Mingle, talk to people, join a small group, share your doubts. I say Thomas was at fault because he failed to accept any reality except that which he could grasp with his own senses. Unless I see, unless I thrust my hand into his side, unless I touch. Poor Thomas, when seeing and touching are such a small part of what we can know and experience, things which are seen, said Paul, pass away. They're transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And this isn't just a theological or philosophical reflection. It's a fact. I, I can't prove the greatness of the great. I can't prove the beauty of the beautiful. I, I cannot prove that love is better than hate or courage better than cowardice. We watch a ship sail out. And off there on what we call the horizon, it disappears, it's gone. But the horizon isn't real. And if we could see a little farther, we'd know the truth, that the ship is just as big and just as real as when she left the harbor. John Pollockhorn is a particle physicist and an Anglican priest. Now, that's quite a nice combination to be tops in your field in physics and also an eminent theologian. He writes that science, scientists can tell you that music is vibrations of the air, the neural excitations of the eardrum, that sort of thing. All of which is true and interesting, but the mystery of music, the reality of music eludes science. Polycorn says, I I'm not content in my search for truth to have a sort of truncated understanding that says, well, music, wonder, religious experience, they're all sort of froth. They seem, he says, much more than that. Moral intuitions and experience of beauty elude science. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God, that's our faith. We trust in Christ beyond the horizon. We believe in his goodness beyond our sight. We trust his word against the optic nerve. And Jesus said, Thomas, you believe because you see me. Blessed are those who see not and yet believe. He said that because the one thing we cannot do is hold on to him. Better we let him hold on to us, perhaps better if we let him take us into the presence of God, who is not behind us, but ahead of us, every step of the way. Last week, how interesting that the Gospel of Mark just stops in the middle of everything and says, he's going before you to Galilee. What an ending, an unfinished ending. Why Galilee? That's where it started. 
That was the ordinary life. That's where he's going to be found. Seeing is believing sometimes, but just as often believing is seeing. As the great Augustine wrote, to have faith is to believe where you cannot see. And the reward of faith is to see what you believe. The trouble with those who won't move beyond seeing is believing is that they don't believe enough to see. And therefore, they cannot see enough to believe. Christ called even Thomas to faith. Consider us, we pray, in all our times of doubt and keep us from despair. Grant that as we pursue the ordinary demands of our daily routine, we may discover your presence again and be refreshed by a faith less easily shaken. Lord, in your mercy. We pray as a company of those who love you 
that we may be given whatever it takes to run with patience the race that is set before us. Make us the kind of Christians that invite rather than hinder faith, disciplined and informed, generous and compassionate, venturesome and joyful. After the manner of our Savior, keep us at the side of those who need us. Thicken the ties that unite us with all who love you by whatever name or sign. Use us where and as you will until the fever of life is over, our work is done, and we rest in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we pray for those in need and name them now before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear us as we remember those whom we've loved and lost, whose presence is still so real to us. Hear us as we remember them. Lord, in your mercy, all these words, however broken, we offer you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whose table we prepare now to come. Amen. We are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.